Aloha and welcome to Thumbing Through Yesterday, the podcast where we take our favorite books off the shelf, dust them off, and remind ourselves why it is we love them so. My name's Tom Galley, and joining me today, we've got Tony Pasculi. Happy to be here, Tom. And what are we talking about today? Today, today we're talking about a very dusty book indeed. Uh, we were talking about, oh, that was a pun. That was terrible. I apologize. That was unintentional. <laughs> we were talking about Dune. Uh, uh, that, was, that was a good, terrible pun. <laughs> I only meant to say that this is an old, old favorite uh, that I haven't actually revisited in a long time. Uh, I have read it a couple of times, and it is uh, a standout book, um, and... Uh, yeah, well worth coming back to and sort of been on my mind uh, recently because of the uh, the new film adaptation. Yep. Yeah. So we've been we've been both discussing this as a potential pick, uh, and uh, I picked it, but uh, you easily could have picked it. Yep, uh, indeed. Yeah. This this is uh, something I have read many a time and definitely falls in my definition of favorites. I think you've probably read it more than me, and uh, and it's probably more of a favorite of yours. But I do like it. It's considered one of the greatest science fiction novels ever written. It's incredible world building. I mean, just, mm -hmm. just staggering. Uh, and it's got some incredible characters too and some scenes that are just standout scenes that are breathtaking that have stayed with me, you know, for decades. Um, they just, they lodge themselves in your mind. The scene with the, the I don't even know how to pronounce this, the gom jabber or the gom jabbar. Gom jabbar is, is yeah. what okay. I hear. <clears throat> Um, that is such a, such an indelible scene. And there are other scenes like that throughout the book. And, you know, God, if, if for nothing else, uh, this book would be famous for the, uh, for the litany of fear, you know, <laughs> I must not fear, fear is the mind killer, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, yeah, but I haven't read this book. I haven't read, I first read this in sixth grade. It was a little over my head. And but it made an impression on me even then. Read it again in high school for a science fiction class. Uh, loved it even more, and I probably read it at least one time since then. But I think only those three times until until this week. Yeah, I don't actually have a count, but I, I've read it more than three times. I'm fairly yeah. certain. So yeah, I mean, to me, this is a favorite mostly because of the world building, because of the yeah. depth of the of the world that he's built. And this is, you know, it's interesting. He's his process in a way was a little bit like Tolkien's. Tolkien just, you know, invented all these languages, did all this research, um, it created this whole world and then sort of created a, uh, a story to show off that world. And Herbert worked in a similar way, according to the essay at the end by his son, mm -hmm. that he spent years and years and years on this of just mapping this thing out. This is a book that has appendices. It has four numbered appendices plus a map plus a uh, a glossary of terms, mm -hmm. which is essential for reading. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Now this, you talked about a lot of these books that we have gone back, that have gone back so far have not held up, have not stood the test of time. And I think what's possibly one of the reasons this has stood up so well is it is so freaking far in the future, mm. right? Uh, we, <clears throat> we don't get a clear answer, but we're talking about something on the order of 20 or 25,000 years in our future um, when the events of Dune are taking place. You know, In about 10,000 years, we're going to have the Butlerian Jihad, um, mm -hmm. which is going to be the fight of man against thinking machine. Um, and then it's something on the order of 12,000 years, 13,000 years after that, that the events of Dune happen. It is set so far in the future that he can write any form of culture, any form of technology he wants, and we we can't compare it to anything, right? We can't, you know, like something written in 1965, like or when we did um, uh, Dragon's Egg, we're mm. laughing about the computer, the vision of what a computer <laughs> is going to be by the yes. year 2000, you know? Yeah. Um, that just doesn't work here. Yeah, in a way, this works almost as a fantasy because, you know, even though nominally it is set in a multi-planetary empire, uh, 10,000 planets was my estimate based on some fact somewhere that he throw away fact. Um, and that there is interstellar travel faster than light. Uh, it mostly takes place on this one planet. It's very, very local. Uh, there's not a lot of technology. There's there's lasers and atomics, which they can't really use much. And shields, shields is the most significant piece of technology that people use. Well, that's you see, I don't. It's interesting. I don't consider this a science fiction book. You know, it doesn't strike me as that. But you're there is. Tons 
because of technology, like the Fremen still suits, the manufacturing, yes. the, the the tents that they use, the magnetic sand compactor for digging their way out. I mean, this thing is it's actually dripping with sci-fi tech, and yet it doesn't read like a sci-fi book to me. It it reads like you were talking about, you know, a, a trip of a troop of um, undeveloped people, you know, nomads living out on the prairie or something. Yeah, I, I think I think that's mostly. Uh, mostly to the good. I think it, yeah. meal, it feels smaller and more personal than something where the, the technology takes over too much of the story. It doesn't. The technology yeah. mostly gets out of the way, as important as it is. Uh, but yeah, it's... Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's never about the tech. Yes. It's only about the people and the, and the plot, even though they're surrounded by this stuff. It's, it's inconsequential that they're surrounded by yeah. these things. Now, it does feel like science fiction to me because it's just dripping in this trope, which is one of my favorites we talked about before, is like the trope of the competent man, mm -hmm. where, where people, people are supremely rational and they make their decisions and they have a sort of, I mean, the, the whole thrust of the Bene Gesserit uh, is to create people who think better than other people, a superior form of human being. In fact, uh, the Mother Superior at the beginning distinguishes between people and human beings. Yes, she does. Yeah. She's testing, at one point she tests Paul to see whether or not he may be human. Yes. And of course the, the cost for failing the test is death. Yes. In this particular case, she doesn't yeah. go around testing everybody, but yes. <laughs> no, they have to be worth testing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that to me is a very, very science fiction idea. Uh, this idea of, of sort of, especially the science fiction of the, of the 60s, and this is from 1965, uh, kind of in the period when uh, Heinlein was writing also, and he played with these ideas as well, uh, and some others. Of, of people training themselves to be better, uh, to be smarter, that, that there is so much wasted potential in humanity. Uh, and a lot of science fiction writers tackled this yeah. idea and came up with a science fiction way to like sort of liberate people. Um, well, and you've got actually multiple examples of this. Like mm -hmm. You mentioned the Bene Gesserit with their, their breeding program trying to to make improved people and some of the things they develop. But you've also got the Mintats. Uh, you've got the Guild Navigators. Uh, there, there are multiple organizations, fraternities, families. I don't know how to, how to best frame this, but that have found a way to make themselves better than human in one way or another. And then they become commodities or you know, integral to the functioning of other society, like the Guild Navigators. Uh, we don't really ever get a look at them in this one, but we know that they're special. Yeah. Okay, there's a quote I'm looking for, but while I'm scrolling through my my notes looking for it, uh, let's talk about the Mentats a little bit. Okay. Because I remember the Mentats, and I found myself being incredibly disappointed by them in this book, on this reread, that they're supposed to be uh, these people who are their most highly tuned, they're, they're, they're the replacement for computers. Mm -hmm. They've gotten rid of computers, and because they can't do without that kind of computation entirely, uh, they develop a, a sort of... Um, I don't know, a training program to create these people who are much, much better at thinking than other people. And they're the Mentats. And everybody has one, <laughs> one who does all their advanced thinking for them. And I don't think we ever see a good example of a Mentat coming up with anything that no one else could have come up with. Now, this, <laughs> this, this is something that annoyed me a little bit in this read through. And I think it's annoyed me in the past. There are People ascribe this incredible depth and complexity mm -hmm. to the plots the, mm -hmm. that are woven through Dune. And even the characters within are self-congratulatory about the depth and complexity of the plots <laughs> that they're spinning. The, Vlad, the, Varen, the Baron Vladimir Harkonnen you know, even says, this is not a wonderful thing I have done, the depths, <laughs> the plots within plots. And what's the whole plot? He has a traitor. Yeah. <laughs> yep, you have a traitor in the Atreides house who's going to turn off the shields. Yeah. Wow, yeah. that ooh, nobody else would have gone with that. You know, so over and over again, the, um, they're they're hitting this. You know, Frank is doing it in a little self congratulatory way, and other people talking about the book talk about it as, as it is like almost unfathomably deep, and it's actually not. All of the plots are kind of predictable. Yeah. So you know, uh, as I was reading this, I kept comparing it uh, unfavorably in my mind to Shogun. Mm -hmm. which um, for a number of reasons. And one, I think Shogun also has incredible world building, but Clavel has an advantage in that that was a world that actually existed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So he's, he's got a leg up there. 
But also Clavel does this wonderful thing where he's, he's, he's taking us, he's doing a lot of head hopping where he goes into the minds of the characters and explores the incredible subtle dance that these people are doing with each other over uh, sort of the, for the protocol of a tea ceremony or, or the mm-hmm. tension and whether or not uh, the Anjin san is going to take the knife and commit seppuku or whether he can be stopped in time. Uh, and we get into the heads of these characters and, and it really, really works. And there is quite a comp- bit of complexity in those plots and those characters I think are incredibly subtle. Uh, and these characters are not by contrast. Yeah. And the head hopping to me feels forced. And every time we go into someone's head and get their italicized thoughts, I'm just like, yes, we knew that. <laughs> 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 You're not revealing anything here. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, on that very note. There's a, a moment in here where they have just, the Atreides have just landed on Dune and the Lady Jessica is talking to the Shadout Mapes mm-hmm. and the Shadout Mapes has shown her the, the Christ knife. Yeah. Um, and she says, do you know what it is? And Jessica started to say, it's a maker. I Mapes wailed. <laughs> it was a sound of both grief and elation. She trembled so hard the knife blade sent glittering shards of reflection shooting around the room. Jessica waited, poised. She had intended to say the knife was a maker of death and then add the ancient word, but her every sense warned her now, all the deep training alertness that exposed the meaning of the most casual muscle twitch. You really needed deep sense <laughs> training to expose the fact that, that she went, I <laughs> when you said maker? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> the Benny Jesuit are overrated is what yeah. I'm thinking. Although I do... Okay, so even though I'm not impressed with the Mentats, I was very impressed in the book with the Bene Gesserit because of their one of their dedication to this idea. I mean, mm-hmm. we, but we also see them in action. We see we see Jessica in action, although she does as soon as they're on the run, sort of delegate everything to Paul, her 15 year old son, which is kind of a seems like an abdication of responsibility there. <laughs> uh, but uh, but we see them doing interesting things much more so than we see the Mentats. And uh, and also their incredible patience in this breeding program. You know, they've been working on this breeding program for centuries. Yep. Centuries. Yep. That is staggering. And yeah. then they, uh, well, it doesn't turn out as they had anticipated. It does not. You know. <laughs> Spoiler. That's, that's, that's the way of these things. Yeah. So this is, I found that quote that I was looking for before, um, and I really like this. Ma Dib learned rapidly because his first training was in how to learn. Okay, that, we hear that a lot, you know. Right. Like, it's like, oh, I'm studying philosophy because I'm learning how to think. Yeah, okay, good for you. Uh, but it continues, the first lesson of all was the basic trust that he could learn. It is shocking to find how many people do not believe they can learn and how many more believe learning to be difficult. And that I find to be true, Mm -hmm. that people are just like, oh, I don't know this thing and therefore it's beyond me because I can't take five minutes to sit down and figure it out to actually learn it. Yeah, it's like, oh, what a wonderful thing calculus must be for those who could learn it. (laughs) You could learn it. It's not that hard. Yeah, Uh, it may not be that useful to you, but it's not that hard. Yeah. Uh, So that... As much as the learning how to learn thing, I think, is overrated as a trope, that idea of just grounding that in someone is something you take you take for granted if you are someone who's been brought up that way. Uh, and if you haven't, it's an incredible deficiency in life that you, you know, you get your installed software and nothing more. Yeah, that you're not right. upgradable. So that to me is a... a wonderful passage. Well, now, Paul was raised without his knowledge... Um, in the Mintat training program. Yes. Right? And we find this out just before they leave Caledon for Dune. There, there's a point in the training at which the candidate has to be informed and they have to yes. voluntarily continue. Um, this happened with Paul when he was 15, right? And he made mm-hmm. the decision to continue, not that he got to follow through on it because, yeah. you know, hijinks. But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, he's he's got a little bit of an advantage over every man in that he's yeah. already been indoctrinated into this super thinkers club to some degree. Yeah. And he's also been getting the Bene Gesserit training. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he's got incredible muscular control and emotional control. And he's also been trained in fighting by some of, uh, as we are told, some of the best fighters in uh, in the universe. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's got a lot of pluses on his side. <laughs> he really does. Oh, and he's the Kwisatz Haderach. So he's got that going for him as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... 
list of things that Herbert wrote that were never meant to be pronounced, <laughs> right? So Kwisatz Haderach is on there. Um, Shout out Mapes. Yeah. That's just a weird one. Thufir Hawat. Yeah. He's the, the house Atreides Mintat. Cobain uh, Honoret Ober Advanker Mercantil. I don't know what accent you're supposed to use. It's more than one language there. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. The Tli Laksu, uh, Sardaukar, Gamjabar, you had that earlier. He's got all these things that, you know, when you're reading them, you're reading them and you can just go right over them. But then you yes. get in the conversation and you try to wrap your tongue around yeah. some of these things. It's like, I don't, okay, whatever. Now, the I always said Sardaukar, but maybe Sardau, Sar, how do you say well, it? Well, okay, so when I look <laughs> at the spelling, S-A-R-D-A-U-K-A-R. Yeah. yeah. Right, that D-A-U is what throws me. Yeah. Because most mean, people say Sardaukar. Yes, like, okay. It would be D-U, but it's a D-A-U. It ought to be an owl in there. It's a Sardaukar. Does not really roll off the tongue if it's accented. I don't. I, I think if it's not accented, then you can sort of slide right by that. M- yeah. Mumble it a little bit. But uh, but the Sardaukar, another thing like the Mentats, where they are built up over and over again as being amazing, and then and then we see them in action, and they're just not. Yeah. Well, we see them in action against the Fremen. Yes. Um, who are even more amazing. Who are even more amazing. <laughs> little did they know. Um, you know, and there's I don't. They they allude to it, but we don't actually get to see it. But the the Sardaukar, the emperor has a penal planet called Seleucus Secundus, which yes. is just a god awful place. It's hell incarnate. Yeah. Um, and the people who are surviving there are the people he's recruiting to become Sardaukar. Yeah. Um, well, the Fremen live on Dune, which is another facet of hell incarnate, right? So, yes. Um, you've got these two tribes of super warriors going up against each other, you know. And the Fremen comment is, they're not bad. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think Herbert uh, drops the ball here as a writer because he spends a lot of time telling rather than showing about the Sardaukar, and then when the Freemen take them out, it's supposed to be amazing. But in fact, we have not seen the Sardaukar have a victory. We haven't seen them in action w- whatsoever. So all we have is that they stomp on these people of whom we've had some verbal reports that actually they're very good. Right. And that's supposed to be impressive, and it's not because I don't I don't buy it. Well, What's more right. we, likely? We, we don't see them. You know, they're. They are part of the invasion that drives yeah. the Atreides out, um, dressed in Harkonnen uniforms. But we don't, you're right, we don't ever get to see, everybody yeah. talks about them, everybody's scared of them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they could just be boogeyman tales. Yeah. Related to that, and this is something that, that had always bothered me about this book, and I and it took me until this reading to figure out what actually the plot, what actually is the plot of this book? I mean, why... Why is Dune being given to the Atreides only so that the Harkonnens can can wipe them out? What on earth is that about? We, we are given <laughs> a reason which, in yes. my mind, doesn't hold up. Exactly. Yeah. And right. It, and the, the, the reason is that the Atreides are raising a fighting force comparable in skill to the Sardaukar. Yes. And the Emperor just takes that as a threat. And he wipes out an entire great house because of that? That but, seems And not only does he wipe out an entire great house, but he does it in one of the most convoluted, <laughs> self-destructed ways I can possibly imagine. Yeah. Um, your entire civilization, your entire civilization is dependent on the output of one thing from one planet. You don't play games with crap like that. Yes. You don't take it away from one house and give it to the other with the plan of wiping out that house, taking it back over, and having the production continue. Oh, yeah. And while we're on that, you know, your entire universe runs on this on this very limited resource that comes from one planet. You're going to give that entire planet to one house to begin with? Now, this is actually a problem. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how did the Harkonnens get that monopoly? Yeah. And it is the ultimate monopoly. Yeah. Um, which they don't exploit. Which... Which is also weird. Is interesting, <laughs> yeah. The uh, and there's there's a little bit of of a buffer here in that it's without the spacing guild, nobody can do <coughs> anything about it. And the spacing guild is mm-hmm. very protective, too protective, it turns out, of the spice flow. So they would not authorize. Nobody would be able to get an invasion force yes. to Dune without the spacing guild condoning yes. it, which they do once and almost to a second time, and it does not <laughs> end well for them. Yeah. I do like I do like the spacing guild. The idea of this is one of my favorite science fictional ideas in this book 
is the idea that they have faster than light travel, but it is faster than light travel through space. It's not hyperspace. And so they need to be able to predict the future in order to navigate. That, yep. to me, is brilliant. Yeah, it is very cool. None of the sensors that you know work faster than the speed of light. No, you actually have to yeah. be able to see the future to navigate yes. safely from here to there. Yeah, I love that. That's wonderful. A big dodge around Einstein there, but you know, I'll let it go just for that idea. Yep. Yeah. Now we do know if you look in the appendices, we do know that FTL existed before the Space and Guild and before the discovery of Arrakis. It had to because people had to get to Arrakis and yes. start exporting spice. Yeah, but with the uh, the. But but Larry and Jihad and the death of thinking machines, right? That mm -hmm. was where the spacing guild came from. Uh, and the guild, uh, the guild navigators, unlike the any of the, I believe any of the film or uh, TV adaptations so far, are just normal people with blue eyes. So that, that I don't know that we see. There's, we see guild agents. I don't know if we see guild navigators in this. I think they're called out as guild navigators. Are they, are they two called guys out as at navigators? the end. Yeah. Because I, I do remember like one lost his contact lens. Yes. He was trying to cover his eyes so nobody would. And this this is another thing. <laughs> the guild is trying to protect the secret that they use spice. There's literally nobody in this book who doesn't know the guild navigators <laughs> use spice. Not a one of them. They all yeah. talk about how important spice is to the guild to navigate space. Yes. And yet the guild is somehow trying to protect their secret. Yeah. You know, it'd be like us trying to pretend that cars ran on gasoline was a secret. <laughs> you know, I don't know. So uh, appendices, let's talk about the appendices. I did not read all the appendices. Uh, I did read uh, The Ecology of Dune and mm -hmm. The Notes on Religion or Notes on the Bene Gesserit, I forget what that one was called, uh, and uh, Brian Herbert's afterward. I couldn't get through The Notes on Religion. It, it just got too tedious for me. It's pretty tedious, yeah. but it's clear from that appendix and from reading the book that Herbert was obsessed with this idea of religion, um, that religion is fundamental to how this world operates. Yeah, well, many worlds. Yes. Now, one of the fun things, the Bene Gesserit, um, they make repeated references to the Missionaria Protectiva. Yes. Right? They they send people, agents, to to worlds to plant these religions yes. so that if ever uh, Bene Gesserit's sister is in dire straits, they can play to that. Um, but anyway, they have just arrived at Undun again, um, and Jessica's interacting with some of the Freeman. I think this might be after they're first on the run, or no, it's before they're on, but anyway, um, somebody has said something to her, referred to her as a reverend mother. Mm -hmm. But I'm not a reverend mother, Jessica thought, and then, great mother, they planted that one here? This must be a hideous place. <laughs> we never get a reference to what that one is, right? She had been ruminating on the missionary protectiva and the fact that they do plant religions and, mm -hmm. and myths in the population. And now she's discovered on the fact that they have planted one particular religion or one particular myth that's only reserved for god-awful places. They never tell us what that one is. Good Lord, they planted that one? I assumed it was just the idea that that a reverend mother was a thing because this is something that the Fremen have adopted. They have reverend mothers within their um, mythos, I would say. But but then, you know, it also turns out that their reverend mothers are pretty much identical to B'nai Jesuit reverend mothers anyway. Yep. So I'm not, yeah, that's a little a little vague for me. Yeah, there's, there's that, that's a thread that I don't yeah. think was well developed. I do like, however, how the Missionary Protectiva is introduced. It's introduced in one of the uh, chapter headings mm -hmm. as a quote from an encyclopedia. And just like, what a, what a wonderful way to do exposition. And he just drops so much world building into this one quote. Uh, the wisdom of seeding the known universe with a prophecy pattern for the protection of BG personnel has long been appreciated, uh, but never was seen uh, condition uh, extremists with more ideal mating of person in preparation uh, the prophetic legends had taken on Arrakis, even to the extent of adopted labels, including Reverend Mother. Da, 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 da. And that's it. And it's just this one little quote that draws like, oh, yeah. wow, what an amazing. And they do go on to, he explains it and uses it uh, later in uh, other chapters. But just that one little chunk of exposition at the top of a chapter, which is not even about that, is wonderful. Yeah. Now, since you mentioned that, every chapter starts with a with a quotation yes. out of a published book, and all of them are written by the Princess Irulan. Not not all of them. I, are they? Are they yes. all Irulan? Yep. Ah, okay. They are all her works. She wrote 
A ton. She wrote a ton of books. Of books. Um, but they actually make a joke about that when Paul, at the end, when Paul has decided he's going to marry her so that they oh. have a line to the throne. <laughs> she has but literary like, pretensions, yeah. Yeah. Maybe that will give her comfort because she's not getting any of me, right? Yeah. I'm saving I'm yeah. saving myself for my for Channy. Shanny. Channy. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, Princess Erlen got kind of the short end of that stick. Although, you know, she gets to be Empress, I suppose. That's something. Yeah. I guess they all are all her. I mean, there's many, many books, some of which are encyclopedias, some of which are more personal narratives. Uh, yep. Yeah. But she wrote encyclopedias. Yes. <laughs> right. So people live longer with the spice, right? They, it's referred yes. to repeatedly as a geriatric. Yes. Um, yeah. I forget what the second word. Anyway, but it, it prolongs life and long, along with the other things which it does. Yeah. Oh, okay. And I just happened to scroll to uh, y- Yui. Yui, the doctor, uh-huh. which, which this is another one of those things where, where he sets up a thing and he, he tells us that imperial conditioning is unbreakable. And then we see that it was broken by threatening the man's wife. It's like, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that was, you know, and, and again, this is one of the things the Baron is so self-congratulatory about. <laughs> I have broken this unbreakable condition. Or, you know, conditioning. Um, well, how did he do it? I threatened to keep the guy's wife alive and keep torturing her. Yeah. Right? The guy's hoping that the Baron will kill his wife. That's This, this, is, this is why he turns traitor is to get his wife killed yeah. so she'll be out of torture's way. Yeah. I mean, not not to make light of the of the torture uh, and that that's, that's a horrible thing, but no one else had the had the stones to think of torture as a way of breaking imperial conditioning because obviously the reason the doctors have imperial conditioning is because assassination is such a common form of of inter-house rivalry now that was yeah. fun and yeah. the fact that they have specific <laughs> names for how yes you know there's a name for if you poison somebody in the liquid there's a name if you poison somebody in the food there's a name for poisoning somebody with poison on your blade you know yeah. there's so many specific names to the to the art of assassination and vendetta you know, yeah. that, that felt very medieval to me. That was really fun. I enjoy that. It did feel very medieval. Yeah, although that brings up another thing where the Mentat, uh, their, Thufur is their Mentat, mm-hmm. and he goes through and he says, I've searched the whole house, it's clean. And then immediately there's an assassination attempt against Paul. Yeah. Uh, and it's like, ah, I missed that one, damn it. <laughs> yeah, and, and they have a, they, they write in an excuse, right? There was, he did a level two search and they should have done a level three search, right? They should have brought in the probes to look through the walls. Because, yeah. you know, the guy had been walled up, literally walled up weeks before the Harkonnens left. Yes, um, it, was, it was a very good, it was a very good uh, deep attempt. But at the same time, I'm just like, you keep saying these things and then contradicting yourself. Yeah. You say the Mentats are amazing and they're not. You say the Imperial conditioning is unbreakable and it's not. You say the Sardaukar are indefeatable and, and they're, they're not. not. <laughs> yeah, they, they don't even stand up well to the Fremen. Yeah, no. Know? Yeah. So, yeah. I yep. mean, uh, exigencies of storytelling and et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, I found that disappointing, especially because the world building is so, so rich and complex in other areas. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So you have talked about, because uh, I've never read any of the other books. I think I, I think I tried to read Dune Messiah and I did not fare well with it. It, it was not compelling to me. Uh, but this Dune saga is like five books. Herbert Frank wrote, Herbert wrote six books. Six books. And okay. then his son has continued on to write many, many more Yes. Well, um, let's let's discount those. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll stick with. <laughs> you know, and I, I think we're both of similar um, belief here, and that the 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 property really belongs to the originator, unless it was created yes. to be a shared universe. Yeah. Um. Uh. It kind of dies. You know, Amber died with Zelazny. Absolutely. Um, I kind of feel like Dune should have died with with Frank. But anyway, yeah. The uh the the six that he wrote are kind of fascinating in a way that they span. Close to 6,000 years. Mm-hmm. And by the time you get to the end of the last one, you feel like he's just getting good and started. Really? Um, it's, it's breathtaking. Interesting. So you think, you think the next five books are worth reading? They Obviously, are, now you've read them a couple of times. They do not all have the, the enjoyability level of Dune. There, mm-hmm. There's a little bit oh. of up and down there in how <laughs> much pleasure one gets. But you know, some of them have to be swallowed in order to get to the next one. So the next one is Dune Messiah. Dune Messiah, right. and then 
Children of Dune? Children of Dune and then God Emperor. God Emperor. Chapter House. Chapter House, then Heretics? I don't know. Or Heretics, then Chapter House. But anyway, Dune Messiah is shortly after the events of Dune. Yeah. We have uh, Alia has children. Um, Fascinating. Who are the subject of Children of Dune. Um, and then uh, her son becomes the God Emperor of Dune. Um, and he reigns for a little over 5,000 years. Then we get on, and, and he does some serious social engineering with the entire <laughs> empire over that 5,000 years, and then we get on into Chapter House and Heretics. So having read the six, do you feel like the story of Dune is properly contained in Dune and these are editions, or do you feel like the story is the six-book arc, or is the story I the think story some Frank other set out, subset? He set out to write a trilogy, um, and I kind of feel like if you read all six, it's obvious where that jumps, right? Between when we end children and then pick up with God Emperor, um, I think it's obvious that he hadn't initially planned to go there. Interesting. Um, I think that Dune is beautifully self-contained. Um, if you read Messiah, you've got no choice but to proceed <laughs> to children. Gotcha. Um, so, and it may be the same thing. It may be when he wrote Dune, he was unsure if there was a future to it. So it was written you know, to have a nice solid ending. Well, it did take him a long time to write. And it took him a long time to publish. Yeah. I yeah. discovered that. That too, yeah. And then it was published by Chilton, who publishes auto manuals. <laughs> <laughs> I've had many Chilton books over the years for That's my old cars. That's crazy to me. That's like Tom Clancy being published. His uh, Hunt for Red October was published by someone that published nonfiction books about, you know, submarine construction or something, or just some really? random ass, some random ass nonfiction publisher said, oh, we like this. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. So I just wanted to say one thing about having read the essay by Brian Herbert at the end. And I think it's I think it's tempting to think of him as someone who's jumping on his father's bandwagon and milking it for all it's worth. And there might be an extent to which that is true. But I, I like to think that what he's doing is connecting with his father in a way that he wasn't able to do while his father was alive. Could well be. And you know, I've read several of the Brian Herbert books. I I don't think they measure up to the Frank Herbert books, mm -hmm. um, even the ones that are supposedly based on Frank's notes. But if you read his his prefaces and his afterwards, he's very self-deprecating. He's very aware that he's not yeah. his father. Um, yeah. And he's very aware that he's trying to fill shoes that he feels are too big for him. Yeah. Um, but he also talks about how his father was very distant when he was growing up, that he would frequently lock himself in his room uh, with his notes. Because this is, again, this was a period of years, most of which was during... Uh, Brian's childhood. He, his father was absent for much of his childhood because he was working on this book. Mm -hmm. And and he didn't have feel like he had a close relationship with him. And it was only, only later that he felt like, you know, by going back and revisiting these manuscripts and by working on them himself, that he felt that deep appreciation and love for his father. And he felt like there was a reciprocal love for him in the books and the way he talks about family. So that was really nice. I the His afterword here was... Very moving. Yeah. yeah, I thought. I don't. I don't fault Frank for trying to continue the work. I fault him for not being a better writer. Um, but I don't fault him for for what he's trying to do. I would never fault someone for for landing on a valuable IP and trying to make the most of it. Yeah. Yeah. Knock yourself out. But yeah. But I. But I. I think I like to give him credit for it being more than just a money grab. Yeah. yeah. No. I. I agree with that. Uh, I had one other thought about Dune, which was that to me, it feels very much like the inspiration for The Matrix. It would not surprise me if that were, were at least partially true. Yeah, yeah. and, it, and it, I think there's a lot of parallels, obviously, in having a chosen one uh, and having an entire society that lives in caves. And there was one reference in particular that made me just click over into Matrix land, which was uh, they talk about the Fremen having an orgy after a battle. Uh, it's just like, oh, we just got to let them have this. Yeah. <laughs> And it's like, and that reminded me of the the ridiculous rave scene in the second Matrix movie. And that it's thing like, was like twenty minutes long. Yeah, it was nuts. Yeah, and in and in Dune, it's one sentence. Yeah, yeah. which is the appropriate length of. <laughs> this this is actually a note that I made. Um, there's no sex in this. When you think about science fiction novels that are yeah. written in the late '60s and through the '70s, 
so many authors just used it as a vehicle to slip sex in. Yes. Um, you know, and, and we don't need to name names here. <laughs> but, you know, you had talked before about the fact your parents gave you unrestricted access to science fiction yes. books without any clue about what was in those books. You know, and this is a book he just steered clear of it. There, there was no need to have a sex scene, gratuitous sex scene in here. I guess gratuitous means there's no need, right? Yeah, but, yeah. And, and there's not, you know? There isn't. That's true. Uh, although I would say... Not that they, science fiction authors, use it as an excuse to slip sex in. I would say that science fiction authors, by by dint of being who they were, colossal nerds, were obsessed with sex. <laughs> <laughs> and so they wrote about it. And then, yep. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, people like Heinlein, who was just inventing all the different, you know, ways that, uh, that sex could, the, the possibilities for sex could have on society. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't think this loses anything for not having sex scenes in no, it. No, I, I, I agree. I was just, you know, it, it was a conscious thought. Because I remember, you know, in a previous episode, we were we were actually getting down on somebody because there was so much sex. I think it was Glory Road, perhaps. There's it, a but lot anyway, of sex it was, in Glory Road. It was probably a Heinlein book. It was, yeah. it was a Heinlein book, I'm almost sure. But, you know, we, we got down on the fact that was, we, we could do without all this sex. And I was realizing, yeah. hey, look, here's a contemporary of the man. There's not a whole lot of sex in this. Woohoo! Yeah. One thing he does, and this... There's a certain point at which I'm like, the guy's got enough names, or the place has got enough names. Yeah. Right? So here we have Paul Atreides, who becomes the Duke Atreides, to the Freeman. He's Usul, known mm -hmm. as Paul Maudib. He's the Lisan Al Gaib, the yep. Madhi, and of course the Kwisatz Haderach. Yes. <laughs> And those are just the ones I thought to write down. I'm not sure I didn't miss one or two along the oh, way. Oh, yeah. It's worse than a Russian novel. Yeah. Everybody's got multiple names. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't have anything else on Dune. Do you? I think I have exhausted my uh, my notes here. Yep, I'm good. All right. Oh, I did want to say the the of the appendices besides the the Brian Herbert um, afterward, uh, the actual Frank Herbert appendices. The one on the ecology of Dune was amazing. It and really was. was. That was nice. And I almost I feel like he had to have consulted with you know some sort of climate expert or yeah. Or I don't guess they really are all planetologists <laughs> at this point, but uh, I, it would make sense to have a planetologist. A climatolog we have a climatologist because we only have one climate to consider, um, and we might have exoclimatologists, I guess. But uh, but if you have multiple planets, if you have ten thousand planets to consider, then planetologist makes much more sense as a title. And aside yeah. from the ridiculousness of sandworms, uh, <laughs> ridiculous, you say. <laughs> Called out by John Varley and Titan when Gaia makes a, a sandworm and decides it's completely useless. Yeah. <laughs> Just kind of yep, lolls yep. around on the sand. Um, aside from that, the ecology, I think, is very well done, very insightful. So, yeah. Oh, and those of you that have streaming, I don't remember if this was on Netflix or, uh, or Amazon, but I was clicking along and there was a movie called Planet Dune. <laughs> This is not, <laughs> that movie is not this book. It's fun to watch because it is god-awful bad sci-fi, blatantly ripped off from this and stunningly well filmed. Hmm. Um, but yeah, if you come across something called Planet Dune, it has nothing in common with what we're talking about. Just warning Good to there. know. Good to know. All right. All right. That was Dune. So what's up, Dune. Uh, what's up next? Going in the way back, way back <laughs> machine, some A.A. A. Milne with... Winnie the Pooh and the House at Pooh Corner. Oh, I cannot wait for Winnie the Pooh. All right, we'll see you in two weeks. See you in two weeks. <laughs>